In honor of Black History Month, United States Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Rachel Levine, has a very important message. Climate change is racist. Take a look at a video released by Levine yesterday revealing how black Americans are most impacted by climate change. Hello, I'm Admiral Rachel Levine. This Black History Month, I'm pleased to partner with OMH in advancing better health through better understanding for black communities. Climate change is having a disproportionate effect on the physical and mental health of black communities. Black Americans are more likely than white Americans to live in areas and housing that increase their susceptibility to climate-related health issues. And 65% of black Americans report feeling anxious about climate change's impact. Through our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity and the Office of Environmental Justice, we're working with providers and community leaders to identify innovative approaches that empower communities to address the health consequences linked to climate change. Visit hhs.gov for more information and tune in next Thursday to hear from another HHS leader on how you can contribute to advancing better health for black communities. All right, Jessica, I've always been curious about this claim that climate change is racist because it disproportionately impacts marginalized groups because pollution is more common in low-income inner city areas or by people who can't afford to move away from pollutants. But isn't that more of a question of class disparities as opposed to racial disparities? I think that specific one is uh, climate change uh, can't be racist, but did racism cause black people disproportionately be impacted being impacted by climate change, I would say yes. Firstly, you have mostly black Americans being concentrated in the Southeast. That's because that's where there were a lot of plantations and that's where many African Americans were brought to the United States during chattel slavery. And so that's also the area of the United States that's most impacted by dangerous storms. There are studies that show by 2050, it's 17% of black owned, home, owned homes that will be at risk for storm damage. That's compared to 10% overall for the United States, but even within the greater Southeast United States, you have black residents 1.6% more likely than the average US uh, population within the Southeast to experience a one in 100 year flooding event. Uh, in the case of Hurricane Katrina, there was 30% of residents there in Louisiana, New Orleans in 2005 that didn't have cars, which made it really difficult for them to flee. But also we see these low lying areas really susceptible to flooding are predominantly low income, but also predominantly people of color. Uh, in South LA, you also have uh, that being a predominantly uh, people of color neighborhood and you have three fifths of the residents not having air conditioning. So there's all kinds of problems. There's the flooding, there's the severe storms, there's the threat of heat stroke. There were studies out of the University of Virginia that showed in redlined neighborhoods, even within the same city uh, where there are black residents, the temperatures are even hotter. So yes, I do think it's an issue that will affect black Americans more than the general United States population. But do I think that we only discuss that because it's Black History Month? No, we should discuss that all the time. Yeah, I mean, to me, it just seems like the Biden administration is trying to take this away from an income inequality issue or a class issue for the purpose of making this sort of a racially divisive thing on Black History Month. I mean, we previously heard from Trans Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg that basically bridges and roads are racist because in New York there were parkways built where large buses couldn't get from low-income communities to the beach, and Robert Moses, the person who built those parkways, was accused of doing so to intentionally keep black and, uh, and brown Americans out of Jones Beach because he considered them unclean. Thanks to a Washington Post fact check, we now know that this one uh, particular claim about Robert Moses has been heavily disputed by historians and that the parkways that he built in New York were actually comparatively uh, more accessible um, to ones throughout the rest of the United States, that the bridges were, when measured, actually very consistent with the normal parkway heights and that he actually took great care to make sure that he could give as much access as possible to people from outside of New York and the Long Island island communities. Parkways, of course, were created because of the idea that people should have a luxurious driving experience free of large tractor trailers, buses, and other uh, cars that created a lot of exhaust. 
So I'm just always skeptical of these claims from uh, the Biden administration and from the climate activists left more generally, because you go back and you look at the history and it turns out that some of their claims are either greatly exaggerated or turn out not to be true. I mean, in the natural disaster instance, for example, we know that natural disasters are becoming less deadly every single year, even as we claim that climate change is getting increasingly bad. And, and so you have these sort of contradicting narratives that don't really square. Yeah, I mean, we have gotten better at evacuations and having better emergency protocol around storms. Storms are getting more severe as time goes on, and that's, you know, been proven in the data and is projected to continue by climate scientists. It's also not just, you know, the activists in the administration presenting this information, the statistic around 2050 that not low-income homes, but specifically black homes, will be disproportionately affected by severe storms, 17% for black homes compared to 10% overall for U.S. residents. That's coming from McKinsey and Company, which is you know not a, not a particular climate activist at all. The University of Virginia also posting that study on redlining, not just within low-income neighborhoods, but specifically the black areas of neighborhoods are experiencing hotter temperatures. So of course this has to do with black history, given the fact that you know the Southeast United States is majorly populated by black people compared to the rest of America because of our history of chattel slavery and is also disproportionately going to be affected by the storms that are the result of rising global temperatures and will increase in, t in intensity because of that change in the climate. So it's a lot of really prestigious universities publishing this. It's not coming from activists or the, the Biden administration, but I think you know the relevant narrative around the time of black history is not just, we only care about black problems during this month, it should be a time to teach black history and, and the foundation of why storms are more intense for black Americans, because it is connected to chattel slavery. You mentioned that uh, the, the temperatures are apparently hotter in the same neighborhoods when you look at where black people live in those neighborhoods and where uh, non-people of color live in those neighborhoods. Why That's do you right. think that might be? Well, a lot of public policy studies have shown that what reduces temperatures in a lot of urban areas is having more areas of grass, more parks, more trees, and actually a concentration of concrete and roofs that are not made to be you know, friendly to hot temperatures. If you have a whiter roof made of different materials and better insulation, they're not as hot. It has to do with the qualities of materials used to construct the buildings. But I think the biggest factor is the, the prevalence of blacktop and the lack of greenery in those neighborhoods. And how did we get to the point that only black people are living in the parts of the neighborhoods where there's poor housing materials and no green space? Well, during the periods of segregation, there was less investment in communities that were overwhelmingly populated by black Americans during Jim Crow. Right, but people have the ability to move at this point. I mean, we're talking about decades prior to where we are now. Well, how, how are they still... Um, so perfectly segregated at this point that they are experiencing higher temperatures than their white compatriots. Well, moving requires money, Amber, and that's not right, something everyone has. I understand that, but you're saying that it's, it's, it's individuals in the same low-income neighborhood, but different sections of that neighborhood. So is the argument that the black poor people are just way poorer than the white poor people? Well, the white people are in the area that during segregation was given more resources and in public investment and therefore has more greenery and different pavement and better insulation. Right, but you said that it's a low income neighborhood, right? So presumably all of the people who live in that neighborhood are about the same income level. Um, how is it that a black person couldn't afford to move to the part with more green space, but a white person could? The white people were already there during segregation. Right, but my point is that people are capable of moving within neighborhoods, right? So how is it that they're still segregated that way? Well, it takes money to move. So if everyone in a low-income area doesn't have the money for new investment to buy a house or to move to a different neighborhood, that right, would but, be why they wouldn't but, move. Right, but most people don't just uh, live in the same house that their parents lived in or, you're, I mean, typically you don't have five, six, seven generations all growing up in the same house in a neighborhood. So I, I'm just not sure that I am understanding how exactly that's happening. Well, that's also the effect of redlining in neighborhoods when you have the continuation of policy similar to segregation, where you have it generally understood by a lot of the real estate agents. It's not an explicit policy to have continued segregation, but it's been observed that this happens, that white families are sold homes when black families are not. 
But a huge part of this as well is that's your community. If you're living in your community where there's, you know, your family, that's where your parents grew up, it makes sense that people would want to continue to live where their community is. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I just, I guess at this point, I'm curious um, if there's still some disparity in how the government is providing resources to areas, because um, if you're talking about the same low-income neighborhood, uh, at this point, is the government still giving more resources to the white side of the low-income neighborhood as compared to the black side? I guess I'm just not understanding how, over the past 70 years, there hasn't been enough progress that the government is still apparently preventing black people from having green space. Well, a lot of the wealth that was accumulated through chattel slavery is still in the hands of white families and has been passed down for generations. Unless the government did wealth redistribution policies and, you know, tax the wealth acquired through slavery or just tax wealth in general, we won't see that be corrected. But in the case of segregation, when you have neighborhoods be invested in during the Jim Crow era and you have them planting trees and creating parks, unless those trees are chopped down and those parks are paid over, those areas are still going to have more greenery and have cooler temperatures than the areas that were not invested in during Jim Crow, unless there's an explicit investment to say, we're investing in these communities that have been left behind, we're gonna plant trees, we're gonna you know, pave roads with different materials, we're gonna invest in these communities, unless you know, there's some equalization of the spread of resources, we're gonna see the path dependency of the, the, the post-Civil War segregation we saw continue. Does the redistribution go just from white families who have been proven to have benefited, benefited financi directly financially from slavery to black families that are descendants of slaves, or is it all white people to all black people? I don't know. They haven't done any redistribution, unfortunately. I would like to see a wealth cap in the United States. I would like to see them you know, tax any wealth over $100 million and invest that in all communities and assess their communities and see you know, which neighborhoods need more investment than others. Does this neighborhood have a park while this other neighborhood doesn't? I think that would be the kind of analysis you would make and redistributing, redistributing a lot of that wealth acquired through a very progressive wealth tax. Reparations would be something different, but what we're talking about here is really an investment in neighborhoods, not a direct wealth transfer from the descendants of slaves uh, to, you know, black, uh, or rather from slave owners to the descendants of slaves. That would be reparations. What I'm talking about is just wealth redistribution. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. We'll be back with more Rising after this.